This is a picture of a man named Vasily Arkhipov. If you do not know who he is, you damned well should, because you owe your life to this man, as do I. Let me explain. Back in late 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, Vasily was stationed on one of four Soviet B-59 submarines just off the coast of Cuba. This submarine was floating so deep in the water that they could not monitor any radio traffic from above. They were completely ignorant of what was transpiring on the surface. On October 27th, Vasily and his Soviet comrades were being bombarded by depth charges from the United States Navy. This was not to try and destroy the submarines, but to try and get them to surface so that the U.S. could identify them. To the captain of Vasily's submarine, Valentin Savitsky, the depth charges were indistinguishable from a global thermonuclear exchange. In this tense situation, Valentin concluded that World War III had started. Therefore, he wanted to fulfill his expected duty and to launch the nuclear weapon stationed on his submarine. But before he could do this, he had to abide by a chain of command. He had to get the approval of two other men to launch. One was political officer Ivan Maslenikov, and the other was the chief of staff, Vasily Arkhipov. Ivan said yes to the launch. Vasily said no. If Vasily did not say no, then that would have been the end of life as we knew it. It was at that moment that Vasily had to decide what was more important imposition of one's ideology on the planet by any means necessary, or the preservation of life so we can fight for the more universal goal of world peace. And the latter barely won. It's interesting because this whole situation was brought about by government actors who say they desire world peace, but their form of world peace involves the constant threat of nuclear retaliation. Then again, it's hard to blame them. Because the only way we, collectively as a species, can leave this false peace behind is to fully disarm ourselves of nuclear weapons. And we all know that that will never happen. So, is world peace even a viable option? Or is it an illusion? The way I see it, there are only two potential answers. On the one hand, we can accept that as long as mankind exists, there will always be war and there will never be true peace. On the other hand, we can hope for a future much like the one that the famous inventor, Thomas Edison, envisioned. One where there exists a machine or force so fearful in its potentialities, so absolutely terrifying, that even man, the fighter, who will dare torture and death in order to inflict torture and death, will be so appalled and so abandon war forever. Peace is the one-word theme for Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, a game that attempts to create a world where Thomas Edison's infernal machine exists. The entire game is one long meditation on the viability of world peace. Is it an achievable goal? Is it even a desirable goal? How do I know that your conception of world peace is the same as mine? These and other questions haunt the characters and the gamer for the entirety of the game's runtime. My appreciation of these concepts and questions is further heightened by the game's reception by the audience. Though the game was universally praised, just like all the other mainline Metal Gear games, the number of people who played it was relatively small. This is due to the fact that the game launched exclusively on the PlayStation Portable and didn't release on consoles until over a year later. This made sales of the game outside of Japan unexpectedly low. This qualifies Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker as underrated in my mind, and thus compels greater appreciation by default. Not only was the gameplay the predicate for the archetypal perfection of Metal Gear Solid 5's gameplay, I would say the story was far superior to Metal Gear Solid V's story and maybe one or two of the other stories in the Metal Gear Saga. This is largely due to the philosophical rumination on the concept of peace and whether or not war is a necessary factor in that equation. By the time the game is done, you will have to choose your own answer to that question, just as the character Big Boss did. In a situation where your life or the lives of others are threatened, Will you lay down your weapon for the nobler goal of peace? 
Or will you pick up a weapon and fight for what you believe in? If you choose the latter option, then you will have to be prepared to chase after the biggest gun there is, in the hopes that your opponent doesn't get to it first. Back at the end of Metal Gear Solid 3, you will recall that Big Boss was tasked with killing his former mentor, a woman known as The Boss. Up until her assassination, Big Boss was led to believe that she was a Soviet defector. But this was actually a ruse. She was serving as a double agent, pretending to work for the Soviets. However, one action committed by an actual Soviet agent, Colonel Volgin, complicated the situation. Volgin launched an American-made nuke at a Soviet research facility, a nuke that was given to the Soviets by the boss, as proof of her supposedly genuine defection. The inevitable result of this was suspicion from the Soviets, suspicion that the Americans launched a nuclear weapon at their homeland. In order for the United States to prove their innocence, they had to send Big Boss, who at the time was known as Naked Snake, to kill her. The worst consequence of this mission was not that Big Boss had to kill the woman who was like a mother to him, it was that her reputation had to be tarnished in the process. The Boss would forever be made out to be a traitor to the United States, when in fact, her sacrifice prevented a global thermonuclear exchange. Disgusted by the way the United States and Russia handled the situation, Big Boss left the United States behind and moved to Central America. Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker takes place 10 years after the events of Operation Snake Eater in 1974. Big Boss has shed his former title, returning to his former alias Snake. He resides in Colombia, in an area near the Barranquilla coast. There, he started his own mercenary unit, one that was not beholden to any country or ideology. This organization was known as Militaires Sans Frontières, Soldiers Without Borders. Any nation, business, or individual contractor could hire Snake and his soldiers to fight the battles that they could not or would not. One day, a professor and a student from the United Nations University for Peace sought out MSF for their indiscriminate services. The professor was named Ramon Galvez Mena, and the student was named Paz Ortega Andrade. They asked Snake and his employee, Kazuhira Miller, Kaz, to repel forces threatening their country of Costa Rica. These forces are suspected to be American forces, sent in there by the CIA to set up bases. The Costa Ricans cannot keep the American forces out due to Article 12 of their constitution, which prevents Costa Rica from creating their own army. The professor appeals to their emotions by talking about how he preached the virtues of peace at the university for 20 years. The student speaks about her own pacifist ideology as well. The subtextual point that they are trying to make is that if they are appealing to Snake and Cause to engage in violence, it is because they were truly desperate. This is certainly the case for Paz, who was recently kidnapped by the American forces and tortured. If Snake and Kaz accepted the job, the professor would offer the MSF a forward operating base out in the Caribbean, and a helicopter for transport. Kaz is suspicious of the professor's true motives. They surmise that if the professor and student are against the Americans setting up shop in Costa Rica, maybe they are sympathetic to the Soviets, or might be KGB themselves. They confront the professor about this, and he, surprisingly, confirms Kaz and Snake's suspicions. Although he denies Paz has any involvement with the Soviets, nor any knowledge of his affiliation, he goes on to make the case that whoever controls Central America wins the Cold War. That is why the Soviets were backing the Sandinista revolutionaries in Nicaragua, and now hope to repel the CIA forces in Costa Rica. If Snake accepts this mission, he will be going against his former homeland. Though MSF was set up to not answer to any nation or ideology, he nonetheless struggles with supporting the very enemy he worked against ten years prior. This inner dissonance is quickly broken, though, when the professor gives a cassette tape to Snake. This tape was recorded by a friend of Paz when they were recording bird sounds near an American base. They were inevitably captured by the Americans, but their tape was, thankfully, recovered. 
On this tape, Snake hears a very familiar voice. Before any doubt can rise in Snake's mind, the professor tells him that he carried out a voice print analysis. The voice they hear on the tape is undeniably that of Snake's former mentor, the boss. This convinces Snake to take the mission. Even though he says he is doing the mission for Pass, everybody else knows that Snake is really doing it to find the source of that voice. Snake infiltrates an American base and finds a couple of pieces of intriguing intel. He not only notices that the soldiers are wearing film badges, but hears talk about quote-unquote spears being loaded onto a barge. Film badges are used to measure radiation exposure, and spears are a slang term for nukes. This suggests that the Americans are bringing nukes into Costa Rica. This is shocking for more than obvious reasons. The import of nuclear weapons into Latin America would violate the Tlatelolco Treaty of 1969, which forbid the existence of nukes on the continent. If word of this got out, Latin America could become a powder keg, and a new, worse version of the Cuban Missile Crisis could break out. But this was not enough to confirm their existence. Snake had to see the weapons himself. Snake then interrogates a soldier, asking where the spears are being sent. He reveals that they are being sent to Mount Irasu. Before Snake can head there, Kaz recommends that he meet up with a nearby Sandinista Comandante, so that they may provide Snake with support during his infiltration. He locates a boathouse in a swamp near Rio del Jade, owned by the National Sandinista Liberation Front. There, he finds that the Comandante and her team have been tied up by CIA forces. He frees the team and learns the Comandante's name, Amanda Valenciano Libre. She tells Snake that the CIA plans to stage a coup in Costa Rica, like they did in Chile. She does not have any concrete evidence to offer for this statement, though she does speak of seeing large amounts of sophisticated weaponry, an amount that would be more than necessary to take on her and the other Sandinistas. Her statement is quickly confirmed because she, Snake, and her team are suddenly ambushed by squads of soldiers, along with an unmanned, sophisticated-looking aircraft. This aircraft captures one of Amanda's comrades, who just so happens to be her brother, Chico. Snake and Amanda successfully fight off the other squads and chase after the aircraft that took Chico. During this pursuit, Amanda is almost kidnapped by the same unmanned aircraft, but thankfully, Snake lands a shot on the aircraft's tether and frees Amanda, though she does suffer a broken leg during her fall. Snake is then forced to send Amanda back to MSF's base so she can heal, while he goes after Chico on his own. Snake tracks Chico to a prison facility in an area called Camino de Lava. After discovering his cell, Chico tells Snake about the CIA's secret shipping route. Apparently, the nukes were being shipped upriver to an underground tunnel which opened up on the other side of Mount Irasu. Right when Snake is about to send Chico on a Fulton balloon back to base, Chico asks for Snake to kill him. He makes this request because he apparently betrayed the location of his team during interrogation. He does not feel he could face his comrades after doing this, and that the more honorable thing would be to die. At least then he could be free from the guilt and be at peace. But Snake refuses. Snake knows better than anybody how hard it is to retain information during torture, that there is no shame in letting that pain get the better of you. What Snake thinks would be shameful is letting this young man, filled with courage, strength, and honor, take the easy path to inner peace. Snake feels that Chico's qualities can be put to much greater use, that he can still achieve his and his sister's goal of Nicaraguan liberation. He convinces Chico that he still possesses great worth, that he can truly earn his desired peace by continuing to fight for what he believes in. Thankfully, Chico agrees. Snake then Fultons Chico back to base where he can begin his new path, fighting alongside the MSF. Snake follows Chico's directions to Mount Irasu. He searches the trucks near the underground base only to find that the nuclear weapons had already been unloaded. He tries to find them elsewhere, and while doing so, he comes across two men arguing. One is a nuclear engineer named Huey Emmerich, 
and the other is CIA Station Chief of Central America, Hot Coldman. Their conversation confirms not only the existence of nuclear weapons on site, but that the CIA actually plans to launch a nuke. Coldman argues in favor of the three principles of nuclear deterrence theory. One, you must have nukes. Two, you must never fire a nuke first. And three, when your opponent fires a nuke at you, you must strike back. What is interesting is that immediately after he details these three points, he argues that his plan regarding nuclear deterrence necessitates America launching a nuke first, in order to prove America's might to the world. Why this is not contradictory is unclear at first. What we do know is that Emmerich disagrees. Even though he believes in nuclear deterrence theory, he does not believe that launching a nuke would facilitate deterrence of any form. Nor did he know that this was the CIA's plan all along. He vociferously refuses to let his technology facilitate the launching of Coldman's nuke. But Coldman is indifferent to this refusal, demonstrating as much by pushing Emmerich down a flight of stairs. As Coldman leaves the room, Snake runs over to Emmerich to see if he's okay. Emmerich tells Snake that Coldman plans to launch a nuke. Upon hearing this, Snake runs after Coldman. He happens upon a large open top hangar. There, he finds a gigantic mechanized robot being airlifted out of the hangar by the previously mentioned unmanned aircraft. Snake is then ambushed by a tank that bears a striking resemblance to the Soviet Shagohod from Metal Gear Solid 3. Snake dispatches the tank and then returns to Emmerich, who reveals the plans of the CIA. First, Emmerich explains that the nukes that Snake was looking for were on the mech that was just airlifted out of the hangar, a mech that he refers to as Peace Walker. Emmerich explains that he created Peace Walker to be an unmanned bipedal tank that could launch nuclear weapons from any type of terrain, a tank that is very similar in function to Metal Gear Rex from Metal Gear Solid 1. The only difference between Rex and Peace Walker was that Peace Walker could only launch a nuclear weapon after a Soviet ally launched one first. This would be made possible by an onboard artificial intelligence, one that was programmed to bypass the human instinct of self-preservation. In other words, unlike a human, an AI-powered robot would not be reluctant to launch a nuke. If someone were to launch a nuke at US-occupied territory, Peace Walker will definitely retaliate. It is hard not to see the logic in Coldman's perspective, especially given the fact that he references the incident involving Vasily Arkhipov during the game. In most cases, it can be argued that human beings would not willingly launch nukes in order to assert the superiority of one's ideology. Instead, they'll favor the preservation of life. However, if there is a chance event where a psychopathic leader launches a nuke at your homeland, Goldman and several others would argue that the world could not afford to have a reluctant human in charge of the nuclear button. The world simply cannot be ruled over by a corrupt, immoral ideology. In other words, it would be better for all human life to perish than for some to live under the tyranny of capitalism or communism. To Coldman, the peace of death would be better than the terror of living. However, like many ideologies, the ideology behind Peace Walker only looks good on paper. In practice, it too is corrupt and immoral, not least because it required the launching of a nuke in order to establish this new form of deterrence. Emmerich goes on to explain the logic behind Coleman's form of deterrence. Apparently Coleman believed that in order to establish Peace Walker's insured retaliation, and to deter the Soviets from ever firing a nuke, the US had to fire a nuke to demonstrate its power. This, in theory, would be the first and last nuke to ever be launched. On the surface, this method of nuclear deterrence seems effective, at least to those who are willing to crack a few eggs. But what about people like Emmerich? What about the lives that might be lost to the nuke launched by Peace Walker? And the after effects of radiation? Who is to say that the US would never become a fully evil totalitarian power like the one that they fear? 
And what if there was a slight corruption with the code powering the onboard AI? These, amongst other questions, work against the Peace Walker Project. Questions that you and I are capable of presenting. Though these questions might seem obvious to us, they are not as obvious to an ideologue like Coldman, enamored with his own idea of peace. Emmerich explains that the AI that powers Peace Walker is not complete yet, but is expected to be complete in five days. Almost immediately after it is completed, Peace Walker is expected to launch a nuke. Emmerich suggests that Snake find the woman responsible for the creation of the Peace Walker AI, a woman named Dr. Strangelove. Her lab is located in a Mayan ruin a few miles north of their location. He suggests that Snake head there and destroy the AI. Emmerich is then Fultoned back to base, and Snake proceeds north. Upon arriving at the ruins, he discovers Dr. Strangelove waiting for him. Almost immediately after their initial meeting, Strangelove reveals her knowledge of the events surrounding Operation Snake Eater. She condemns Snake for killing the boss, the woman that not only he loved most, but that she loved most. Strangelove was well acquainted with the boss prior to the events of MGS3. She worked with her on the US's Mercury Project, the one that sent the boss out into space. During her encounters with the boss, Strangelove quickly fell in love with everything about her, as so many others did. So, of course, upon learning about the events of Operation Snake Eater, she was not only angry at what Snake did, she felt deceived. She could not accept that a woman like the boss would betray her country and defect. She knew in her heart that Snake knew something that she didn't, and she would not find peace until she uncovered the truth. She asks Snake about what really happened, but Snake only gives her the quote-unquote official story, that the boss was a traitor to the United States and that he was ordered to assassinate her. Despite the anger induced by Snake's response, Strangelove invites Snake into her research facility to show him the AI that would power Peace Walker, a device that Strangelove called the Mammal Pod. As they walked up to the Mammal Pod, Snake heard a familiar voice emit from within the cylindrical shell. It was that of the boss. He now understood that the voice that was captured on Paz's cassette tape came from Strangelove's AI. But what was the true nature of this voice? Strangelove explained that the AI that resides within the Mammal Pod was the closest recreation of the boss's personality that she could make. Strangelove felt that if Peace Walker was going to have a fully rational AI that would not fall to the predations of human instinct, the best mind that could power it would be that of the boss. Strangelove was granted every conceivable document regarding the boss's life from the CIA. Also, she could ensure the completion of this project. However, there was a missing piece. Strangelove was unsure of the boss's true state of mind during Operation Snake Eater. In order for the AI to be a full recreation, she would need the truth, and only Snake would be able to tell her. Strangelove understands the emotional difficulty of Snake's task, of destroying this recreation of his former mentor. What would it be like for Snake to kill the boss a second time, even if it was only an approximate version of his former mentor? She knew that he wouldn't have the guts. In fact, she was so confident in her belief that she dared Snake to destroy the Mammal Pod. Though Snake tries to do so, he passes out during the disassembly process. Strangelove then leaves with the Mammal Pod and leaves the unconscious Snake behind. Kaz informs Snake that Peace Walker was now located at a facility 15 miles north of Strangelove's lab, at a lab disguised as a rock quarry. He travels there by horse and is unfortunately discovered soon after his arrival. He battles off multiple forces, including another AI-powered tank. Snake's eventual defeat of the tank results in a massive explosion, which sends shrapnel into a nearby door. The door's destruction allows Snake access to the underground facility. He discovers the location of the Mammal Pod again, and quietly slips into it while the guards were taking a break. 
Before he destroys it, Snake begins to question the boss's true intentions. He begins to question whether or not her debriefing, as told to him by Eva from Metal Gear Solid 3, was true as well. To test the AI's capability of recreating the boss's personality, he asks it questions regarding Operation Snake Eater. Questions like whether or not the boss defected to the Soviet Union of her own free will. When the AI says that it has no record of this or anything else that Snake asks her about, Snake is able to gather the courage to destroy the AI. But before he could, he is discovered by the guards, Strangelove, and Coldman. Snake attempts to fight back against the guards, and in the ensuing chaos, he manages to grab Strangelove's ID card and hide it on his person before he is finally subdued. Just before Coldman kills him, Strangelove requests that she interrogate Snake first. Coldman agrees, and soon after, Snake suffers torture by electrical shocks, similar to the torture he suffered at the hands of Wolgan in Metal Gear Solid 3. Strangelove once again asks about the truth behind the boss's demise, but once again, Snake refuses to tell her the truth. This befuddles Strangelove. She knows that Snake is lying. After all, why would he wear the boss's bandana if she was truly a dishonorable war criminal? Unlike the other torture scenes in the other Metal Gear Solid games, this one arguably has the greatest stakes and the most emotional impact. Of course, we understand that if Snake revealed what truly happened to the boss, the AI would be completed, and the nuke would be launched. But there's the added temptation of letting the AI be completed, because then the boss would basically return to life, albeit in the form of a metal tube. Snake's refusal to tell the truth to Strangelove demonstrates the profound strength and discipline inherent to his body and mind, that he would rather give the world a chance at peace, even if it means eternally sacrificing his chance for inner peace. Following the torture, Snake is then taken to a cell, which he easily escapes thanks to Strangelove's ID card. Upon escape, Kaz tells Snake that Poss is missing, Snake suspects that Coldman kidnapped her. This would make sense because not only would this deter MSF from interfering with Peace Walker, it would provide Coldman with potential information about Snake's contractors. Coldman suspects that Pass, like her professor, is KGB. If she were KGB, the intel that she could give him would be priceless to the CIA. Snake heads back to Peace Walker's hangar and has his suspicions quickly confirmed. While holding Poss at gunpoint, Coldman tells Snake that the mammal pod had been completed. Strangelove had deduced the truth behind the boss's demise while torturing Snake, and used that information to complete the boss's AI. Coldman then reveals that he plans to launch the nuke at MSF's mother base, located out in the Caribbean Sea. This would be done by providing Peace Walker with false data regarding a Soviet attack, the data would then be reverse engineered so that Peace Walker did not nuke a Soviet base, but MSF's mother base. The radioactive fallout would be carried over to Central America via trade winds, causing fish and crops to die. This would allow the US to employ those farmers so they can build multiple Peace Walker variations and scatter them all over Central America. But before Coldman could fire the nuke, he needed to demonstrate to the White House Peace Walker's all-terrain capabilities. Peace Walker prepares to march north, but right before it can do this, Snake fires upon the giant mech, and a fight ensues. Snake was able to do a decent amount of damage to Peace Walker, causing it to collapse and the AI to start behaving erratically. In response, Coldman uses his helicopter to fire upon the mammal pod, causing Peace Walker to transform into a quadrupedal form and attempt an escape. Snake chases after it on horseback but is unable to continue once he and his horse reach a steep cliff. Snake is then forced to watch helplessly as Peace Walker crosses the Rio San Juan. But all hope was not yet lost. Amanda gathered intel from her compass regarding Peace Walker's new location. It was now at a U.S. supply base on the southeastern shore of Lago Cochiboca, 
Better yet, Emmerich uncovered intel suggesting that Peace Walker would not launch for another two days. This was likely because there was a US-Soviet summit that would be taking place in Vladivostok regarding the Second Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, or SALT II. Revealing Peace Walker's capabilities during the summit would either disrupt the talks or give the US severe leverage during the negotiations. Following the recovery of this intel, Snake infiltrated the supply base and traveled to a nearby communications tower, the place where Peace Walker would likely be controlled. Upon arriving there, he finds a video feed of Paz in his cell. He attempts to communicate with Paz, trying to find out her location. But before he could do that, a series of alarms begin to ring through the facility. Snake's presence had been uncovered. Anticipating this possibility, MSF forces begin to travel from Mother Base over to Lago Kochiboka, ready to support Snake. Kaz then suggests Snake go to a different communications tower in the northeastern part of the base. As Snake makes his way there, he cannot help but notice that many of the soldiers were not American. They were Russian. Though this was disturbing, neither Snake nor Kaz had any time to make sense of this. They had to focus on stopping the launch. Snake arrives at the Northeast Tower and finds Coldman and Paz. Coldman reveals that all the preparations for the launch had been completed. All that had to be done was to input the launch codes into a computer. Said computer was in a briefcase attached to Coldman's arm. Right before the code is input, or before Snake can shoot, an unexpected guest arrives. It is Professor Ramon Galvez. He proceeds to make several revelations, the least shocking of which is that his real name isn't Ramon Galvez Mina. It's Vladimir Alexandrovich Zadornov. Zadornov reveals that he and Coldman were working together all along. He was the one that provided the Americans with the technology to build Peace Walker in exchange for land and troops. This makes sense, and not just because there were Russian soldiers patrolling the American base. It also makes sense because the Metal Gear technology that built Peace Walker's predecessor, the Shagohod, was originally Russian technology, and the Russians would not give up those weapon specs without a quid pro quo. Despite this initial agreement, Zadornov betrays Coldman, saying that he plans to use the nuke for his own purposes. Instead of launching the nuke at MSF's mother base, he would launch it at Cuba, and by proxy, have America suffer the blame. Zadornov then grabs Coldman's gun and places it into Paz's hands, ordering her to shoot. Zadornov encourages her, reminding her what Coleman's forces did to her when she was initially captured. Despite the temptation, Paz ultimately could not fire the weapon, because it would violate her pacifist principles. Zadornov then takes the gun and fires two shots into Coleman's chest. He then turned the gun to Snake. Before executing him, Zadornov complimented his ability to bring an army together against the Americans, comparing him to Che Guevara. Zadornov planned to stage Snake's death in a way similar to that of Guevara's, in that he would be quote-unquote executed by the CIA. This would inspire the Sandinistas and several other rebel groups to fight against the influence of the US, bringing the Soviets and communism closer to victory. But before Snake could be executed, the MSF forces arrive and quell the standoff. Among the forces was Amanda, who personally dispatched Zadornov herself, saying that her Sandinistas would not be puppets of the KGB, that they would win their own victories. As things cooled down, Snake was confronted by an apologetic strangelove. She expresses sympathy for what Snake had to go through killing the boss. She also stressed that she only wanted to know the truth regarding what happened to the boss, what her state of mind was during Operation Snake Eater. Apparently, Strangelove learned the truth after fully completing the AI, and she wanted Snake to hear it himself. So, Snake and Strangelove head back to Peace Walker to go and talk to the AI. Just when everything seemed to be over, Coldman wakes up aboard an MSF helicopter, with the computer still attached to his wrist, he sends false data to NORAD regarding a Soviet attack. Before he died, he wanted to prove his point, that humans do not truly possess the will to launch nukes. Nobody wants to go down in history as the Great Destroyer. In his mind, 
People value their reputations more than they do their lives. But this means that any sense of national strength or peace via possession of nukes is an illusion. In order to truly assert a nation's strength, in order to ensure peace, that nation needs a weapon, like Peace Walker. They need Thomas Edison's ultimate machine. Aside from Coldman, nobody else involved wished to test his theory. Snake proceeds to try and destroy Peace Walker, shooting every heavy weapon he possesses at it. Though he succeeds in small bursts, there's always something rendering his efforts invalid. At first, Snake destroys Peace Walker's drive system, preventing its ability to launch. However, the data uplink remained intact, meaning that the people at NORAD were still receiving false data. They were still under the impression that the Soviets had launched nukes. This meant Snake would have to destroy the AI in order to stop the data transmission. This proved to be impossible, because the metal surrounding the AI was built to withstand an actual nuclear blast. As Snake tried in vain to destroy Peace Walker, the higher-ups over in Washington, D.C. were debating whether to retaliate against the Soviet's supposed attack. Through the combined efforts of Emmerich and Snake, they managed to get the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a representative of America's Secretary of Defense, on the phone. Snake convinces the Chairman that the missiles are fake, but this was not enough for the other members of the Council. When the Chairman attempted to call off the retaliatory strike, another member pointed a gun at the Chairman's head, effectively overriding his authority. Only minutes away from the U.S.'s retaliation, Snake was giving everything that he and the MSF had to destroy the Mammal Pod. Even if its destruction was an impossibility, they had to try. Just when all hope truly seemed lost, Peace Walker suddenly stood upright, and a song began to ring out from the Mammal Pod. It was a song by the Carpenters, called Sing, synthesized to match the boss's voice. As this song rang out, Peace Walker walked out into the water and drowned itself. As for why this happened, Snake, Strangelove, and Emmerich deduced that the AI was no longer using its brain to function, but rather, its heart. Though this miraculous event prevented a nuclear holocaust, it was not devoid of tragedy. The AI's choice to lay down its weapons and sing reflected the boss's state of mind prior to her death. She, too, chose to stop fighting, preferring the higher ideal of peace through pacifism and disarmament. This was her true state of mind at the end of her life. One would hope that the boss's will in this regard would be powerful enough to inspire Snake to do the same. But unfortunately, Snake could not agree with the boss's change in perspective. He considered the boss's choice to lay down her weapons, to sacrifice her life for her country rather than live on for herself. He considered that a betrayal. Snake decided he would do what the boss did not, to live on, to continue fighting for what he believed in. And to signify this new change in attitude, Snake adopted his former title. From now on, he would be referred to as Big Boss. Before I conclude, I wish to acknowledge that I am leaving out the game's epilogue, where Poss reveals her true identity. I am doing this for two reasons. First, to give this video a more cohesive flow. But second, and most importantly, I believe that analyzing Poss's reveal would be more effective and pertinent when I inevitably discuss the events that take place in Metal Gear Solid 5.